Welcome to this mini lecture on diabetes mellitus. Now this lecture we will essentially be comparing type 1 with type 2 diabetes mellitus. This lecture will cover in their comparison the pathophysiology, the, the main complications associated with each of them, how they are diagnosed and they are, how, how they are treated. So if, let's start off with a definition. What does the term mean? So diabetes mellitus. Well, we're probably going to jump back to the Greeks. So we're going to go to the Greek language. And diabetes essentially is derived from the word to siphon or to pass through. So I guess in those days that the doctors, the physicians, would have seen patients who have polyuria, so they're urinating a lot. Therefore, their urine, their fluid is passing through. So they have a great amount of urine output. Now, that's the diabetes part. The mellitus part probably comes from the, the word malt or malt, maltose. And that is a type of sugar. And so diabetes mellitus is a sugary urine, essentially. And that's what it means, is it's a sugary state, um, which is different, in contrast, different to diabetes insipidus. Insipidus is the word meaning tasteless. So I guess you could guess that the physicians in the Greek times would have diagnosed these diabetic patients with a lot of urine output, not knowing what the cause is, they're just seeing them urinating a lot um, by tasting their urine. So essentially they'd get the patients, taste the urine. If it was tasteless, that would be diabetic insipidus. If it had a sweet taste, that would be diabetic mellitus. Now the Chinese physicians were a bit smarter than the Greeks and so what they would do is essentially just get the urine and then they would pour it onto an ant hill. If the ants went to that urine they would know it was a diabetes mellitus where if it was an insipidus they wouldn't go to that. Today we're not going to focus on insipidus. Insipidus is more of an ADH problem when you have an in insufficiency of that particular hormone leading to a high amount of urine output. And we're not going to focus today on gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is essentially where the placental hormones in the mother causes her to have a degree of insulin um, desensitization, which leads to an increase in blood sugar. So not only is the mother affected with a kind of a diabetic state, but also the baby is exposed to high amounts of sugar, which affects growth size, etc. And so that's gestational diabetes, which we're not going to focus too much or at all today on. So today is purely on type 1 and type 2. So firstly, the burden it has in the world. So approximately 220 million people in the world at the moment have some form of diabetic mellitus. That's expected to increase up to probably 300 million in about 2020. So it has a huge burden worldwide. In terms of its effect, at least in a country like Australia or probably other comparable first world countries, it, is, it contributes to about six, well, the sixth leading cause of death in this country. And in terms of how many people would have it in the population, so in Australia, 7% of the population have diabetes mellitus. So what is it? Well, let's get the definition. So, Diabetes mellitus is essentially a syndrome, so it's a syndrome of both carbohydrate, CHO, protein and fat metabolism. So that's the essential definition. So it's a syndrome that has a problem with the way that the patient or the person processes carbohydrate, pro protein and fat, particularly the sugars or the carbohydrates. Now what causes that? Well, it's generally caused by, caused by either an insulin deficiency, so that's a complete absence of insulin, and or and or insulin resistance. 
So what is it? It's diabetes mellitus, regardless of if it's one or two, is a syndrome that has a problem with metabolizing sugars, fats, and proteins, which is caused by an insulin deficiency, an insulin deficiency, and or insulin resistance. Type one is always going to be the deficiency. Type two could be a combination of both. Okay? Either way, either type 1 or type 2, the problem is essentially hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. So that's the actual end point. Both cases, type 1, type 2, will have hyperglycemia. And this really leads to how it's diagnosed. So how you would get to the, the conclusion if you had diabetes would be to do a fasting blood glucose. So that's going without eating for a period of time, probably 10, 12 hours. And you have in a blood sugar level of 5.5 up to millimoles per litre. So if you were to fast and have a blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia, of 5.5 up to seven millimoles per litre, you would be diagnosed with diabetes. This is not dictating treatment yet, this is just to come to the diagnosis. We'll discuss that a bit later. So that's the definition, that's what diabetes is. Now we're gonna to move to type one and type two, and at this point focus on what causes it, the pathophysiology on both. Firstly, you might have heard of different terms. Type one, sometimes referred to as child or adolescent, type of diabetes, whereas type 2 is adult onset diabetes. Sometimes this is what, um, termed insulin dependent diabetes or idem, and sometimes this is referred to as non-idem or nidem, so non-insulin dependent diabetes. Now, over the years, over the decades, certain things have changed, so what was once an adult condition now can kind of come closer to adolescence, so it is not common, but it is possible for children, like 12 years of age, to have type 2 diabetes. Whereas type 1 is still an insulin dependent diabetes, so it's still insulin. Whereas type 2 generally isn't insulin dependent, but some patients will be insulin depend dependent. So the best way to define these two is to keep them as type 1 and type 2, and classify them by their cause, or by their pathophysiology. This one is caused by destruction of beta cells. This is more to do with insulin um, desensitization. Okay, so let's start with one. So one I'll do in red, so I'll try and keep this in red. The pathophysiology with type one is a complete, complete insufficiency. So it's complete insufficiency of insulin. No insulin is produced by type 1 persons. Now before it becomes clinical, so before the person actually shows signs and symptoms of this condition, approximately 80 to 90% of their beta cells in their pancreas needs to be destructed. So that means in their pancreas where the problem arises, their beta cells, which produce the insulin, has to be destroyed 80 to 90% before signs and symptoms will come about. Now, it's generally considered an inflammatory condition. Generally inflammatory condition. So that means there's some degree of inflammation in the pancreas that starts the process going, which then causes that beta cell destruction and causes beta cell fibrosis and then leads to complete insulin deficiency. That's essentially what's happening with type 1 diabetes. Now they used to think that it was basically all genetically based. So the person would inherit it genetically from their parents or so forth and then you were guaranteed to get it. However, more recently they've even shown that uh, identical twins, that even 50% like of the cases the other one would develop so it hasn't got a, as strong a link as we once thought. So really, what causes that initial um, aggravation or inflammation to the pancreas is probably a number of things, but we'll call it either immune, 
or non-immune uh, condition. So, there's either going to be an immune or non-immune etiology. So that, what that means, if, if it's immune, it probably has a degree of genetics to it. If it's non-immune, it could have been brought on by environmental factors, like they have certain links to maybe um, being infected by a virus, some allergies with, say, um, cow's milk, possibly living in countries where the hygiene is too high, so like Australia or other parts of the world where there's too much hygiene and therefore predis predisposes the person to certain um, immune responses. And what that would ultimately lead to is a type of insulinitis. Insulinitis. So that's in the beta cell. So regardless if it's an immune aggravation and interaction or a non-immune, we get we can converge into a state of insulinitis, which is essentially beta cell inflammation. And then it leads to beta cell fibrosis. So that would lead to the beta cells in your pancreas to start to be fibrosed, so replaced from the paren parenchymal cells, so the functional cells, into a fibrotic type of cells, which is going to lead to a dysfunction. And that ultimately will cause the lack of insulin release. So no insulin release from the pancreas. And as I said, this is an insidious process. It needs about 80-90% of the B cells to be completely knocked off before the patient will start to present with any clinical signs. So that's kind of the pathophysiology around type 1 diabetes. Now, the, probably if there was an advantage of the type 1 is that um, the long last or the long effects of hyperglycemia, because with the insulin release or the lack of insulin release, the, the glucose can't go into the cells. So as, as a result, the blood sugar goes up, hyperglycemia increases. And so you would start to see the effects of a really high blood sugar level. And this is probably where you start to see the clinical signs starting to manifest in a type 1 diabetic. These would be the osmolarity effect of, um, of sugar in your blood, such as increase in urine. So you will be urinating more, hence the diabetes in the name. You would have sugar in your urine, hence the mellitus. But because you're not getting sugar into your cells in a way that they are starving, so the person is very hungry, and because they're losing a lot of water and probably electrolytes, they are very thirsty. So they've got those three Ps, and they're going to be have a lot of sugar in the urine, which is the classic um, hyperglycemic state of the type 1 diabetic, which is how they're going to present to you. And that's generally going to be at a younger age, generally, than type 2. So that is type 1. Moving across to type 2. Now, just again with type 1, because they are presenting, they haven't had years and years and years of high levels of glucose, at the point of the present presentation, they're going to be relatively, at least from a cardiovascular, a macrovascular point of view, fairly healthy. So then you can kind of expect there's not going to be really any complications at this point with the diabetes. Whereas with type 2, they've had this condition for many years, potentially decades, so a lot of damage has already been done. Okay, when you compare this to type 1, type 2 actually has a strong genetic link. So what that means is, going back to the identical twins, if an identical twin has type 2 diabetes or, or will develop, sorry, will develop later in life, that other identical twin has a 100% chance of also getting it. So it has a very strong link genetically, much stronger than type 1. The other thing that's very clo closely associated with type 2 diabetes is the 
um, BMI or the fat, the size of the person, the BMI. So this is the weight, particularly fat, adipocytes, and particularly where that is distributed. If it is more in the abdominal region, the person has a much higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The reason why that is, is because adipocytes um, needs insulin. It's one of the only parts of the body that actually needs insulin to take up glucose. All right. So the more fat that you have as a person, the more insulin you need. And as the increase in amount of insulin, the more likelihood you have of a resistance. So basically fat um, is relative to your likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. So if you imagine if you have a body type to be 50 kilos and your pancreas is, have, has developed to cater for a body size of 50 kilos, if you were to put up double the size, so if you were to increase to 100 kilos, that would mean that the pancreas hasn't got the capacity to deal with that and it would become deficient in its, um, signal, uh, deficient in its insulin release and that would be problematic in terms of, well, that would increase the likelihood of type 2 diabetes. So, we start off, the process starts off with insulin resistance. Okay, so that's the process. And that could have the genetic link, which could lead to that, or the increased fat or adipose, adipocytes. So that would lead to the insulin release. Now, sorry, insulin resistance. So as that occurs, we have an increase in sugar. So we get hyperglycemia. As a result of the hyperglycemia, the, liver, the pancreas tries to work hard and release more insulin. Increase insulin release. So the pancreas tries to counteract the hyperglycemia, which is brought on by that resistance. It tries to counteract this hyperglycemia by increasing increase in insulin. But with the insulin, insulin is an anabolic uh, hormone, so it's, it increases the storage and the growth. So that would feed back into the fat cells and make it much easier for the fat cells to take up more um, storages of fat of sugar, which is fatty acids. So the fat will be with the insulin will take up more and more fatty acids and store more and more fat. Therefore, the person gets bigger and bigger, which increases the resistance, which increases the glycemia, which in, increases the resistant uh, the release. And so ultimately, we would lead to uh, if this continues anyway, beta cell exhaustion and that would lead to a high amount of hyperglycemia. Now in both cases, both type 1 and type 2, we can see we both end up with hyperglycemia in both cases. In both cases also, the liver, which is trying to regulate this um, hyperglycemia, it for some reason with that low level of insulin or the resistance will the way it regulates the sugars is it causes more problems. So it starts to break down other things to release more sugar. So it will start to grab proteins, break down the proteins and release that into the blood as sugar. So more hyperglycemia, more hyperglycemia. It will start to break down the glycogen in its own liver to release as sugar. That's glycogen lysis. Therefore, more hyperglycemia more hyperglycemia and it might also release some try to release some fat into the blood as sugar therefore more hyperglycemia more hyperglycemia so you can see how this just keeps manifesting however the differences the main differences is this is from a complete beta cell destruction leading to a complete insulin deficiency then you have hyperglycemia whereas this is more starting with a resistance move into a hyperglycemia, move into an increase in insulin release, so you'll have hi hyperinsulinemia, which would then go back to the fat and promote the person to put on more fat, which would then just go through this cycling process, all the way to the point. So 
The person may well and truly have diabetes type 2 at this point, but eventually if it's not rectified, they could move to a complete beta cell exhaustion, which would then move to more of a like a insulin dependency or the insulin would be deficient like type 1. So that's the main differences between the two. As I said with type 1, where the person, once they present clinically, they are still relatively healthy. Type 1 are usually skinnier, so they don't have um, weight problem. And they are generally healthy because they're younger and they don't have comorbidities. Whereas type 2, they've probably got more weight on them. Okay, And so when they present clinically, so when you start to see the signs of hypoglycemia, again similar, polyuria, polydipsia, um, glycosuria, and maybe polyphagia, by the time they get that, they've had years and years, if, if not decades, of the hyperglycemia, so therefore they're going to have side effects of that in the system, such as microvascular injury, so they might have problems with their retina, or they might have problems with their kidneys, or they might have problems with their nerves, or they might have macrovascular problems, such as cardiovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease, etc. So that's how they kind of differ. In terms of their, cl their complications, their complications are going to be very similar. Okay, So in red, now they're going to be basically matching. So the complication is the hyperglycemia over many, many years, which would lead to something called advanced glycosylated end products or age. So these are essentially, because of the hyperglycemia, those sugary molecules jump onto other things which causes detrimental effects in other systems. So those advanced glycosylated end products can cause problems to microvascular structures and macro vascular structures. So the microvascular structures would be they, the advanced glycosylated end products would go to the eye, into the small little vesicles, causing a change in the environment in the retina, which would cause you know release of growth factors and so forth, and blood vessels would start to sprout and grow over the retina, which would lead to a retinopathy. And that's kind of one first part. Another microvascular is in the kidney, so it changes the, the way that the kidney regulates its glomerular filtration and flow, leading to potential renal co complications like renal failure. The third is it affects the small nerves within the body, particularly maybe going down into the legs. So certain nerves have issues with the way that they take up these a a AGEs or certain um, derivatives of of sugar and that can cause a breakdown in the myelin sheaths that are around the nerves and it can cause conditions like neuropathy. And the problem there is the patient loses sensation into their legs, generally their legs first. But they sometimes get sensation problems in what we call the glove and the stocking location. So it's like that they lose sensation in their hands where they would have a glove on or where they would have stockings. And that's the region of the body where they would be affected. And because they can't feel it, or they have a reduction in sensation in their body, they can start to develop ulcers and certain wound breakdowns, which is going to be a problem. So the ones that they both have are these microvascular, so they both have age, which is due to the hyperglycemia, and causing both micro and macrovascular damage. With the macro, this would be damages to, say, ischemic heart diseases that would increase things like angina and increase likelihood of an MI, and it can go into other big vessels like uh, peripheral vascular disease, so looking at the arteries down the leg, etc., and then maybe moving up into the head, so we have cerebral vascular accidents as well. So that's the macrovascular um, association. Now, with the hyperglycemia, Studies suggest it has longer causal effects in the microvascular side of things. So hyperglycemia has a much stronger causal relationship with the diseases in the microvascular than what 
of what we know about the macrovascular. It's more of a correlative effect. So that's the kind of the main effects in the from the, the from the advanced glycosylated end products. Also, in both cases, we would have a decrease in immunity. So both would cause a decrease in immunity. Now, now the big difference. The big difference between the two is, is the acute complications associated with each. The big one associated with type 1 is DKA, diabetes ketoacidosis. So this is basically when the person has that hyperglycemia. Now in this case, they have completely no insulin. So when they're is a state, and sometimes this is their first presentation, they present with the T DKA. Now, if the person has a complete absence, complete absence of insulin, what can result is the body tries to overcome this problem by producing or starting to break down, down fatty acids. So this is lipolysis, breaking down fats into fatty acids to make into sugar. Now, as a result, the fat try as a result the liver tries to modify the fatty acids into sugar but it kind of gets overloaded and as a result it starts to form ketone bodies so that krebs cycle that helps to make atp and so forth it will get to a point where you can't kind of go backwards and as a result we produce or the liver produces ketone bodies which are certain bodies that can be used elsewhere in the body for energy, such as in the brain. Now, in that process of making the ketones, it causes an acidotic state. So it causes the pH to drop and the person can develop metabolic acidosis. And as a result, that could be quite devastating as an acute response or an acute complication. The person will have probably rapid breathing, a massive drop in the pH, so that's going to be systematic effect, dropping consciousness, and can move into a coma if it's not rectified. And that's purely caused by the lack of insulin in this case. So DKA is only found generally in type 1. When it would be most frequently seen in type 1 is either on its first presentation, so the person doesn't know they've got type 1 diabetes, but they present with DKA, or Generally with, say, younger men, they kind of take it for granted. They think they're invincible, so they're not so um, meticulous with their insulin um, treatment. So therefore their insulin levels drop and they go into a DKA state. Or the body has gone into a stress res response, such as being sick after surgery, etc. And the insulin um, doesn't match the glucose levels because you have a huge glucose release from the catecholamines when you are stressed. And therefore, the insulin's very low, you haven't counterbalanced that, and the sugar's high, and you become diabetic, ketoacidotic. So that is generally the DKA. Across on this side, generally type two will not develop DKA. It's not to say they never will, but it's very unlikely, because generally they'll still have insulin on board. If in some cases they are completely deficient, they may develop DKA, but it's very unlikely. But what they will get, or more likely to get, acute, as an acute complication, is what we call hyperosmal hyperglycemia syndrome, or HHS. So this is very, very similar to DKA. The only difference is if they don't go into a ketogenic state, they don't develop, they don't create ketones. But what they will do is they'll have a super hyperglycemia and that's due to um, not regulating their uh, treatment well as well as their liver overproducing uh, the breakdown of proteins, overproducing the breakdown of other things, bumping up, so this is called gluconeogenesis, bumping up the sugar levels which will then cause the effects of hyperglycemia such as urinating lots and lots and lots, losing a lot of water, so they become hypotensive, and losing a lot of electrolytes, so they develop certain complications from the electrolyte imbalance. And that's why they get the, get the hyperosmotic hyperglycemic syndrome.
So now we move on to the diagnosis. The diagnosis for the, di the diabetes is basically the same regardless one or two. It's really just the indication of a very, very high hyperglycemic state, high amounts of glucose in your blood. So in most cases clinically, the way it would be diagnosed is um, with the patient, in both cases, with the patient presenting with the signs and symptoms. So presenting with signs and symptoms. So that would be both presenting with signs and symptoms, these are like the P's, polyuria, polydipsia, glycosuria. So presenting with those, or possibly DKA or HHS, presenting with those alongside a really high blood sugar of, let's say, above 11, I'll just say 11 millimoles per litre. So that would be 11. So basically, clinically, if a person was to present with the classic signs of diabetes, so the polys, um, and a, a blood, sugar, blood sugar level of 11, then they'd probably get the diagnosis on the spot. However, a more accurate test is the fasting blood sugar, so fasting BG, and basically this is where the, the person's gone without sugar or food for a number of hours, 12 hours, and then you take their bloods, and it is basically up here, so it's going to be anything greater than 6.9 millimoles per litre. If they are over that, greater than 6.9 millimoles per litre. If they're over that, they generally would be diabetic or diagnosed with diabetes. So that's the fast in blood glucose. And you'll probably repeat that a number of times, two times, let's say, over a month, let's say, to get the diagnosis. And so that would be a more definitive test than that one, but if they were to present with that, that would be also the case. The other thing that would be actually more sensitive as a test, but is rarely done, is the glucose tolerance test. And so this is basically you're just giving them a bolus of sugar, very strong um, sugary syrup, drinking it, and if they were to go up above 11, again 11, they would be considered... Um, having diabetes. And that would be done over time, but that's a much a set more sensitive test, um, but it's probably rarely done unless you want it on the spot then and there, opposed to maybe the fasting, which has to be done a couple of times. Finally, the other thing that's done quite frequently is the haemoglobin A1C. The haemoglobin A1C. This is basically the glycosylated, the glycosylated haemoglobin from the red blood cell. So it's kind of like a sugary red blood cell. And if it is above 6.5%, so 6.5% of those being glycosylated, okay, which I think would be approximately seven, equivalent to seven millimoles per liter, seven millimoles per liter, of glycosylated haemoglobin, it would be considered another sign of diabetes. Now the advantage of this, this gives you a mean understanding of what the blood sugar has been like for the last few months. Okay, so rather than these just being a one-off reading, this level, the haemoglobin A1Cs, is an indication of how the blood sugar level has been on average 24 hours a day for months. Okay, it's only really accurate for two to three months because as you know, um, red blood cells are replaced every three months. So you would kind of retake it every three months-ish to get a new kind of reading. But within that period, it's giving you a good indication of what the sugar levels have been like. Okay, as average over 24 hour periods for those months. So it's a very good objective reading to be able to know whether the patient has been, if they are diagnosed now with um, diabetes, whether the, when they're taking their blood sugar levels, they are lying to you or not. Or maybe not lying, but just not doing it accurately. So that is very good for the clinician to know how the body has been from a sugar level for many months. Okay, so they're the three main tests that are done in conjunction with diabetes.
Now, on top of that, if the person was to be diagnosed with diabetes, then you would give them certain things to take home and test them themselves. This would be, um, and put into their spreadsheet, this would be what, they, what their blood levels are like um, when they wake up in the morning and they've been fasting. So their fasting levels versus how their sugar levels are after they eat. So you do that comparison, bring it back to the doctor and the doctor can see, okay, so have we had spikes or it's fairly well maintained? And then how does that compare to the A1Cs? And if the, they are below the 6.5, the doctor would be probably considered quite happy that the, the sugar levels are under control. So now we move lastly to the treatment. The treatment of the two is quite simple. Basically, the type 1, or it's simple in terms of understanding, the type 1 is completely because you've got no insulin on board at all. The treatment here is with insulin. So there's no other option. There's no other drugs, there's no other option around this. They have to be given insulin as a treatment. Whereas with type 2 diabetes, now because fat is completely ins insulin dependent to get its sugar, it needs insulin. The other insulin dependent organ is skeletal muscle. Now skeletal muscle um, needs insulin to take up glucose at rest. However, when a muscle is exercising, so it's contracting actively, it doesn't need insulin anymore. So it becomes independent of that. So it can somehow develop or uptake glucose without the need of insulin. So why is that important? Well, one of the best things you can do for your patient with type 2 diabetes is to get them exercising. So increase exercise and weight loss. So if you can do that, plus diet, if you can do this, this is the first line treatment with type 2 diabetes when, once they're diagnosed. This is the first step of regime, is to get their exercise going, because if you get the muscles working, the glucose will be uptaked into the, uh, into the muscles, therefore hyperglycemia will drop. Weight loss, losing fat, therefore it takes the resistance away and the insulin mean uh, away, and therefore the pancreas can have a bit of a rest. And then diet, you reduce the high amounts of, you know, intake of high um, carbohydrate diet that would take a burden off the body. So exercise, weight loss and diet can actually, in 25% of people with type 2 diabetes, so 25% of these guys, if that's done well, that they can diminish their di diabetes. So that's why that's kind of the first step. If that's, doesn't, if that's not working and they've still got hyperglycemia, so they've still got these levels, above 6.5 or their fasting or their uh, postprandial is still high. Therefore, the next form of treatment is the oral anti-hyperglycemics. Okay, so these are the drugs you take to drop the sugar levels. The two main ones is one metformin and two sulfur ureas. So they're the main, like, they're the first mainstay treatment as the oral anti-hyperglycemics, metformin and sulfur ureas. So the difference, basically, if they, you get your patients to do this, if they've still got hyperglycemia, you bring on board the oral anti-hyperglycemics. You generally will bring on metformin as the first mainstay treatment. What that does, is it works at the liver level, so it tells the liver to stop creating more sugar. So stop making that gluconeogenesis, stop producing more and more sugar, therefore dropping the blood sugar level. It also, it also will go to the gut and stop the absorption of sugar into the gut. And so as a result, because metformin doesn't increase the release of insulin, the person or the patient will never get hypoglycemia as it. Okay? So as a side effect, they will never get hypoglycemia, which is a good thing. Another thing it doesn't do is because it doesn't regulate insulin release, unlike the sulfonurias, therefore metformin doesn't cause an increase in fat or weight gain. 
So metformin as a bonus doesn't cause hypoglycemia and it doesn't cause weight gain. Therefore, it can be considered a good drug in the treatment of hypoglycemia. Now, the only side effect it really has, or major side effect, is because of the, probably because of the, the, glyco the, the glucose um, absorption in the gut, it would cause more glucose to stay in the gut. Therefore, the bacteria kind of have a party with all that sugar and produces an irritation and bloating and diarrhea, kind of like lactose intolerance. So that can cause the person to get that GIT complaints. The only other thing it could possibly cause is if the patient has some degree of renal insufficiency can cause a, a lactose acidosis. But that's a rare state. Now, if that wasn't to work, so the metformin didn't help, okay, then they would probably bring on a sulfonurease. Sulfonurease works at the insulin level. So if the beta cell is exhausted, is not releasing insulin, you could bring a sulfonurease on and that would help bump up the in insulin release. Therefore, sugar would go up into the, into the cells. Sh sugar levels would drop. As a result, or as you'd imagine, by increasing insulin, you're going to potentially aid to increase in fat, okay, as a side effect. And because you're releasing insulin, you might have a greater risk of dropping the blood sugar to a hypoglycemic state. So that's the only issue there. Now, if even with these two, if the patient still after two drugs or maybe another drug still had hyperglycemia you would probably then increase or add insulin as the last treatment modality so then it will be more like coming across to this so with patients type 2 diabetic diabetic patients who don't aren't being managed the hyperglycemia isn't being managed with exercise and weight and two to three drugs, oral anti-hypoglycemic drugs, then you'd bring the insulin on board. Now with insulin, there usually are four categories. Four categories is usually the ultra short lasting ones. So this is, you know, peaks within 15, 20 minutes, lasts for three-ish hours. That's ultra short. Then you have maybe rapid, rapid intake of, or rapid uptake of insulin. So that's ultra short, rapid, rapid peaks about two hours, lasts about six hours. That's another option. The next one is the intermediate option, which peaks about six to 12 hours, lasts about 12 to 18 hours. And then finally, the long, long lasting insulin, which peaks after about 14 to 20 hours and can last in the blood for over 24 hours. So they're the four options, the four options of insulin and it's really up to the clinician to see what works best. In most cases, you'd give a long lasting to keep the insulin going through the day, but you'd give an ultra short with meals, okay? And that would be both here and here. So that's basically the treatment options for the diabetics. Just finally, in terms of complications, we spoke about the complications here. You really want to prevent this and this as an acute flare-up in both cases. But how do you keep these away? Okay, so really quickly as a treatment, you wanna make sure that they don't develop cardiovascular issues. So you've gotta keep their LDLs down, you need to keep their hypertension down. Because they've got a decrease in immunity, you probably, the patients will probably get vaccinated yearly with the flu and other potential viruses that could cause problems. And then in terms of the microvascular, this is things like retinopathy, this is like nephropathy and neuropathy. You want to check their eyes every year, so you take them to the ophthalmolo ophthalmologist to check how their eyes are going. If they are starting to get those increase in blood going across the retina, they might need a bit of lasering. You take them to the podiatrist. The podiatrist would do a foot exam every year to make sure that the neuropathy hasn't worsened and there's no ulcers or no issues with the feet. And then you probably want to make sure that the kidneys are working well and there's no issues there. So that's basically diabetes mellitus in a nutshell. We've compared type 1, type 2. So we've got a definition of what it is. We know that there's type 1, type 2, what that actually means. We know the difference in the pathophysiology. We know the complications are very similar between the two because of the hyperglycemia. However, 
DKA is only generally with type 1. HHS is more with 2. Diagnosis is basically the same. And the treatment, only insulin here. Across here, a lot of it can be managed with exercise, weight loss and diet. Oral antihyperglycemic drugs is the second line with particularly metformin and sulfurureas uh, being very good. And if that still isn't regulated, the sugar, then you would bring insulin on board.